In one of the rare moments of perfect harmony at Queen's Park, all three parties voted in favor of making this province barrier-free by the year 2025. However, there are significant concerns among some that we are not on track to make that goal. Two of Ontario's biggest champions to make sure we do are with us now. So we welcome back David Onley, who was Ontario's Lieutenant Governor from 2007 to 2014, and David Lepofsky. He's the volunteer chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. And it is good to have our two Davids back here at TVO. <laughs> Thank you. It's Pleasure to have to be, you back it's here. It's great to be here and to be together. Indeed. Amen. I want to start by referring to an event that you both attended. David Lepofsky, you actually organized. This was back in, towards the end of last year, uh, the 20th anniversary celebration at Queen's Park which recognized sort of the beginnings of the grassroots movement that eventually led to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And at that event, David Onley, you said the following. Mm -hmm. When I was Lieutenant Governor, I had to be apolitical. Well, now I don't have to be. So let me say, accessibility is a national shame. Mm -hmm. Why'd you say that? Because it's true, to begin with. Um, people with disabilities are the the largest single minority group in our society and we, David and I, me because of my physical disability, David uh, being blind, um, we who are members of the disability community are the last group in our society to achieve full civil rights because today people with disabilities do not have full civil rights and I have chosen to characterize it in that term to sharpen the focus of the debate because it happens to be true. You are, I don't have to tell you, not just some guy off the street saying this though. Mm -hmm. As a former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, your words, I presume you have to choose your words more carefully when you say something. So why did you pick that word in particular? Well, I'm not sure what other word we could use. Um, you know, I had the great fortune in representing the Queen for seven years to have uh, a remarkable staff that helped organize all the trips across uh, Ontario that I took uh, at over 2,550 events, spoke to over a million people in the seven years. So it was a lot of traveling, uh, a lot of events, um, and yet the, the work that my staff had to do to make sure that it was accessible enough for me to attend. And I use a compact electric scooter that's, as you know, uh, quite maneuverable. Very nimble, very and, flexible. And, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people have other issues. And so uh, as year by year I saw that the barriers were still there, uh, I came to realize and sharpened my comments as the uh, years went on towards the end of my term. So you never said those words when you were Lieutenant Governor? Correct. But you can now? I, I probably could have when I was Lieutenant Governor, but um, I chose not to. David Lepofsky, do you agree with that rather dramatic characterization. Absolutely. The fact is that we're not only the biggest minority, we are the minority of everyone. Everybody either has a disability now or someone near and dear to them, a parent or a child or a spouse who's got a disability or will get a physical or mental or, sensi or sens uh, sensory disability if they live long enough because as you get older you get disability. So we're the minority of everyone and when, when our government committed 10 years ago to full accessibility by 2025, that's 20 years and 10 years are already up. Uh, they committed on a goal to say everybody should be included, but we are not halfway to full accessibility and we are halfway through the period the government gave us to get there. So it's absolutely accurate to say that. Well, let, I, yeah, I think sure, a lot of it is terminology too. And um, you know, when you think of the different minorities in our society, uh, there's always some variation of the following words. It will always be women, immigrants, aboriginals, LGBT and the disabled. Well, there is no such thing as the disabled. It, that's an adjective. The rest of them are nouns. I'm not an adjective. David's not an adjective. We're nouns. And yet, you know, that's the characterization that, that everyone in, in well-meaning puts together and, and puts out there uh, as the description of the minority groups. There are able-bodied men and women. There are disabled men and women. There are able-bodied aboriginals, disabled aboriginals. There are members of the gay community who are able-bodied and disabled. It's everybody. It cuts, it's, it's irrespective of uh, what your other ethnicity or what your other, your other categorization is. But we don't process the information that way. We don't create our programs that way. We just say it's for the disabled. Hmm. And Steve, that sounds disrespectful to you. It, it's an adjective. And Steve, let me turn this into government. How's the government doing on this? You look at the government of Ontario, and when Premier Wynne appoints a cabinet, 
We're nonpartisan. I'd say this about any premier in this situation, but she appoints a cabinet. She's got a minister responsible for women's issues to be their voice at the cabinet table. She's got a minister responsible for Aboriginal people to be their voice at the cabinet table. Same for newcomers to Canada, same for seniors. Youth. But no minister to be the voice at the cabinet table for people with disabilities who are the minority of everyone. If you look at the Premier's letters that she wrote to every minister last fall to set out their priorities, she had a wide range of important priorities, but it did not include most of the election promises she made on disability accessibility. So what we have is this crushing irony that we are the minority of everyone. We live, as David says, in a province full of accessibility barriers. We've got a great law that unanimously passed that said governments to lead us to full accessibility by 2025. But we're not on schedule to get there. And the government has no plan and no instructions to its own senior ministers to ensure that we get there. Would you prefer to see a minister responsible for um, disability issues in the cabinet? Well, we'd like to see the Premier have one person that she could turn to and say, we've made these commitments, make sure they're kept right now. And we'd also, and even more important than a single minister, we would like the Premier to take the commitments she's made in writing to us and her predecessor did, and she said she'll stand by Dalton McGuinty's promises to us on accessibility. We'd like to have a Premier who at least directs her cabinet to keep those promises because she hasn't done that yet. When you were Lieutenant Governor, you had two Premiers to deal with, McGuinty and Wynne. Were you ever in a position where you could sit down with them and say, you don't have a minister responsible for disability issues, you really need one? That really never came up, to be perfectly frank. And um, uh, maybe it was just a matter of the timing of uh, the situation, because I, I mean, I hear what David is saying. I mean, we've, we've made significant progress in some areas. Um, you know, as you look at most of the new stores, most of the new shopping centers, most of the modern venues, where it's the Air, whether it's the Air Canada Centre or any mo modern um, athletic facility, uh, most of the facilities now, uh, theatres, have become much more accessible than they were um, just a handful of years ago, certainly more than 10 years ago. But the additional area where it's breaking down and why this is such a, a dif difficulty is the matter of employment. Um, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is still significantly higher than it is for the rest of the population. I have said for a number of years that the height of the Great Depression, the highest level of unemployment nationally was 24 percent. And it's virtually double that for people with disabilities today, right now, if in Ontario. If you are disabled, it's 50 percent It's just about 50 percent. Now, the, so the fact of the matter is, for people with disabilities, as they have often said it's not a great depression, it's a perpetual depression. And it's not just the province of Ontario, it's right across the country. It varies uh, hardly at all across the country. So it's irrespective of party alliances or party affiliation or, or governments. It's, it's just an issue that hasn't been resolved and I think primarily because of a series of myths and misperceptions. I think I did a pretty good job as Lieutenant Governor. I think David Lepofsky is a pretty good lawyer notwithstanding the two difficulties that we encounter on a daily basis. And so well, we, we're the ones that, we're the exceptions, if you will, to be able to have punched through the system. But let me do a follow-up here with you, David Lepofsky, and, and it, it stems from something that you said at that 20th anniversary gathering at the, mm -hmm. what was it, the end of November, I think, in yes. uh, mm -hmm. 2014? Yes. Where you said one of the things that your movement has to recognize is that the victories that you appeared to have won 20 years ago in getting this on people's radar screens down at Queen's Park, all those politicians are gone. There's mm -hmm. a whole new crop mm -hmm. of people in there who don't know about the significance of this fight. Do you have to get back in there and start lobbying like hell again to make this happen? In fact, we do. And in fact, we are unveiling a campaign, and I'm happy to announce it right here and now. We are calling on people from all political stripes across this province all over the province to contact their member of the legislature. Our website will have an action kit to tell them how to do this. And just, let's go back to basics. You've got a Disability Act. Would you please implement it? Would you please enforce it? And would you keep your promises on it? That's what we're going to be taking from one MPP to the next. Do you know that we've had four ministers in four years responsible for the Disabilities Act? That kind of revolving door is a guarantee of, of, uh, of ineffectiveness. We've had three deputy ministers in the past four years. I can't count the number of different political advisors for these ministers that we've, we've had to deal with one after the next. They're wonderfully nice and dedicated people. Many of them came to public life 
uh, or public jobs long after this was passed, and they're not aware that we had to sweat a 10-year battle to get this legislation passed. Let me just pick up on, on a couple of uh, things that arise from what, uh, what David said before. Yes, a number of new uh, buildings are more accessible, but not all and not enough. The government passed building code amendments a year ago to try to modernize a very out-of-date building code for, so for new construction, but even their modernization of it isn't very modern. Do you know that the province has built a couple of major courthouses, one in Durham region and one in Kitchener, uh, in the past few years, long after the Disabilities Act was passed, but three quarters of the courtrooms have a judicial dais that a judge with a mobility device can't get onto. So we can't be assured that just because it's new um, that it'll be fully, fully accessible. Mm -hmm. On the, ver the other point I want to just pick up on is the, on the employment point. Uh, minister after minister, government after government says that this is a problem, but what are they doing about it? Uh, commendably, within weeks of Premier Wynne becoming the Premier, her first throne speech promised to work on particularly improving employment opportunities for people with disabilities in the private sector. Two years later, what do they have to show for it? They got a new Minister of Employment, but they don't have any action. It took them a year just to appoint a council to come up with ideas and to give that council a year to report. We're still waiting to hear uh, where that's going. There well, are, there's report after report, study after study in various places, Canada and the U.S., on, on what to do about it. We actually need less study and more action well, right now. David Onley is actually holding one of those mm -hmm. reports. What is, what is that? This is the Rethinking Disability in the uh, Private Sector uh, report. and This was done, commissioned by the late Jim Flaherty, and it was a part of the uh, federal budget in uh, 2012, the spring of 2012, and it reported in January uh, of uh, 2013. It's case studies of success stories of companies who have had an ongoing policy of hiring people with disabilities. And what it demonstrates is a, a whole series of realities that are counterintuitive. Um, the, the perception is for employers from the, both the private sector and the public sector that it, a person with a disability is likely to have higher absenteeism and lower job retention rate and a higher number of WSIB claims. Counterintuitively, all of the studies demonstrate, and this then demonstrates in real world actual cases, that it's the exact opposite. How come? Well, Premier McGinty asked me that once towards the end of his term. He said, how much of that do you think is because the person with a disability is just afraid they'll never get another job opportunity? I said, about 90% of it. Huh. That was what my thinking. I still believe it's that. A person with a disability knows how hard it is to get a job, and so they will fight to keep it. And on that basis, they stay longer, their absenteeism rate is lower, and the number of WSIB claims is a fraction of what it is for the general public, for the able-bodied public. Now, there's a reason for that. As a person who uses long leg braces to walk around, if I need to get something off a shelf, and there's only a, a chair with wheels on it, I'm not going <laughs> to attempt to get on that chair. I'm going to wait for some able-bodied person to come along. Then they can get it off the shelf and or file the, Thus, the claim afterwards. fewer <laughs> silly workplace injuries. Yes, yes yeah. absolutely. And, you know, case after case and corporation after corporation demonstrates that. And the companies who then have hired these, ha hired people with disabilities, they're stunned. They're flabbergasted that, wait a minute, our productivity is going up. And then you get the, the super benefit out of all of that, and that is the benefit of what happens with the rest of the employees who are able-bodied. And what they, the benefit that they, the company gets out of it is that these employees see, well, my company has hired this person with a disability. They're accommodating them. If I ever run into a disability myself, a car accident, something goes wrong and need medical treatment, a slip disc or whatever, I'm going to be treated favorably. And guess what happens then? Their productivity goes up. Hmm. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And, it can be, and the rethinking disability in the private sector report demonstrated that. And you know, one of the spin-offs from that is a, a conference coming up in, in Toronto on February 11th, rethinkingdisabilities.ca at the Sheraton Center. And there will be, uh, I'm speaking there, this is a shameless plug, um, <laughs> I'm speaking there, but so are a number of the executives who are there to convince other business leaders that the success that they are experiencing in these difficult economic times is one of the easiest and fastest ways to enhance productivity and therefore your bottom line. And this, the process is to look at things in a counterintuitive way, that what seems to be obvious 
that this person, no, well, I'm not sure, they're in a wheelchair, I'm just not sure they're going to be able to do this job. No, you have to try to look beyond that. You two are getting along far too well, so I'm <laughs> going to try to introduce a, a potential note of awkwardness here. David Lepofsky, I want to ask you this. Politics is all about the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. Do you think while David Onley was Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, he did everything he possibly could to move the yardsticks on this issue? I got no complaints. The fact that he put... <laughs> uh, see, I mentioned him in my installation address. <laughs> no, no, ser no, no, seriously, the fact that we had a lieutenant governor in place uh, who made this their top issue for advocacy in the sense of making it a, a, an issue that they would focus on uh, was hugely important for us. The fact that everywhere David went to give a talk blazed a trail of accessibility was huge for us. What's unfortunate is that when that term of office ends, um, that impetus uh, from that office ends and we don't see the government, it's great the government has, has brought him on as a special advisor but and I, I can't think of a better source of candid advice uh, on this than, than David Onley, but the government is surrounded by, they got an advisory council, they got us giving advice, they got David giving advice, they got a, an accessibility director giving advice, and, and our answer is like, let's get on with some action. We are, we're under 10 years from full accessibility deadline. The government has the duty to lead us there, and um, it's enough with the uh, just getting our ideas, it's important for them to actually start implementing those ideas. Here's, let me give you just two examples. Uh, number one, they want to do something about employment. One important thing to help people with disabilities get jobs is to ensure that we get the best crack at an education. I'm mm -hmm. not saying there aren't qualified people with disabilities out there ready to work. There are lots of them. However, we've got to get as many people with disabilities, as many qualifications as we can to have our, to have our best crack at it. Our education system, schools, Colleges, universities are full of accessibility barriers for kids who are blind, kids who uh, have mobility issues, people with intellectual disabilities, people with learning disabilities. School boards are trying to do some stuff on it, but nobody has taken a comprehensive look at this in decades. So we, starting three or four years ago, tried to get the government to develop under the Disabilities Act an accessibility standard uh, on education. The government has been dithering over this for three or four years. Now, how hard is it to figure out that we need accessible education for, for, well, for kids with disabilities. Here's, here's one of the issues, David Only, which is you, know, you can tell somebody do this or else as long mm -hmm. as there's an or else. Mm -hmm. You know, if the government doesn't hit its 2025 target, whoever's in power in 2025, no one's going to go to jail, no one's going to get fined, no one's going to lose their job. There are no consequences to the government of Ontario not hitting this target. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, where, where is the, uh, where's the incentive or where's the, uh, the carrot and the stick that you have to prod them with on this? I think the, the internal one, uh, quite frankly, is uh, economic prosperity. Because if you take a, the number of people who are on um, some form of disability assistance in this province uh, and turn them into taxpayers instead of relying on tax dollars, uh, you're having an immediate and dramatic impact uh, on the overall economy. In fact, I don't believe it's, it's possible, and I, I've said this to a whole variety of uh, audiences, and I've asked folks that if they dis disagree with me to please explain where I'm wrong on this, but is it possible to have full economic recovery as long as you have several hundred thousand people who are able to work, want to work, but are not working, they're on government assistance, is it possible to achieve full economic recovery? And the answer is no, especially when businesses are saying, we have a shortage of labor. Where are, we, where are we going to get these workers? Well, we don't have a share, shortage of labor in most of the employment categories. Some, there are not going to be too many people with disabilities working for you know, the forestry industry, cutting down trees. Mm -hmm. There could be a large number of people with disabilities working in the forestry industry in the offices, you know, in the business side of, of things. So that to me is the big prod, is, is looking at it. I believe, quite frankly, it is the key to economic recovery is getting the maximum number of disabled people off government assistance and turn them into taxpayers. There, there's three other answers to your question, Steve, and it's a good one. First, we asked Premier Wynne when she was running for leadership of her party, if she becomes the Premier, will you do you promise to ensure that we are on schedule for full accessibility? She wrote us saying she would. So we've got one thing we can use right now, which is Premier, keep your word. In the last election, we asked the party leaders, all of them, if you're elected, will you direct your senior officials to keep all your election promises and duties on accessibility? Premier Wynne said she would. 
we say, not at four, 10 years from now, but right now, Premier, keep your word. And finally, uh, we, we say that in, in this regard, let's look at one of the safeguards built into the Act. Because we were worried that this could happen, the Act required the government to appoint an independent review of the Disabilities Act every few years. One was conducted last fall by University of Toronto's Mayo Moran. The report has been delivered to the government. The minister responsible, Brad Duguid, said he'll table it in the legislature uh, on the first available day. That first available day, when we look at the calendar, is the next sitting date, February 17th. So we say, minister, keep your word. The, mo the earliest date you can, do you can table that report, make it public, is February 17th. We'll be there if you'll table it. And then let's take what those findings are to provide the Premier with a, ma a road map of how to get us back on schedule for full accessibility as she promised she'd get us. I even wonder if that's possible now because if, they're, if we're more than halfway towards 2025 but we're a long way from halfway towards achieving some of the things you've talked about, David Onley, are we now sort of past the point of no return where you're just not going to hit the target? No, I, I don't think so at all. Um, I think that we have made progress in a whole variety of areas that we've, we've touched on and we could spend lots more time talking about uh, the other areas. I, I think it's a matter, as David was just saying, uh, of looking at what Mayo Moran says. I think that's going to be a very, very important document. Have you seen it? No, I've not seen it yet. Um, I, I think the the you know the the process now is that it is being reviewed by the minister and uh, and no doubt by the premier. I have no inside information on that. Just uh, that is a, in all likelihood. I think it's probably going to be delivered to the legislature very very quickly. Mayo Moran is a very very intelligent woman, and uh, She's a former I think former dean of the U of T Law School. That's correct. Now the province of Trinity years. College. It, exactly. Um, very accomplished. Um, I expect that the, we're going to see something of an action document. Um, and I think what is needed going forward is, is addressing a whole series of very practical solutions that don't require a lot of uh, government involvement. It requires activity. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, people who use wheel-trans services here in Toronto, 416, if they need to go to an event or a circumstance 100 yards into 905, they can't go across the border. They can't drop they have to drop the person off literally at the boundary you, there is no crossing over of because paratransit services wheel from trans nine, can't cross that's correct one jurisdiction to the next so in my particular instance a friend wanted to come to our church seriously disabled wanted to come to our church as an activist and in and so far as uh, accessibility is concerned the church is just inside the 905 border in pickering he had to cancel because we couldn't guarantee that there was going to be a linkage so that the 905 service could meet, meet him there at the border, pick him up, take him the additional two or three kilometers max, and, and then reverse that process Surely going the other way. Surely somebody can exactly. wave a magic wand and say, if it's 100 yards over the border, come on, let's not or get mile, crazy here. Or, or a mile, two, whatever. Or yes. 10, or yeah. whatever, it, it, when you, especially when you see Viva buses zipping in and out of uh, 416 all the time. Right. But, that, but you see, that's like a... That's welcome, a welcome to our world. Exactly. I mean, that's so, and it, that's not a question of budget no. or it's a tough economic it's time. Sense. It's just mismanagement. Mm -hmm. That's why you, the... the the, the brilliance in the design of the Disabilities Act was that it puts the Ontario government in charge of coming up with standards that will set requirements across the province that could fix this. You ask the question, is it possible to get back on schedule? Yes, it is. Ten years ago, or 11 years ago when, the, when McGuinty first won, he in one year turned around a brand new Disabilities Act, got major buy-in for it, got it passed. They, the government doesn't have to live in the state of bureaucratic paralysis that we've been witnessing for the past four or five years. If, the, if those at the top would suddenly just get on with being the leaders they promised they would be. Uh, but to make that easier, we delivered to the government last summer, the, the alliance they have the privilege of sharing, a detailed brief that summarizes how to get back on schedule. It took them six months to write us a letter to respond to our proposals, and it boiled down to thank you for your proposals. Here's all the great things we're already doing. Yours sincerely. Hmm. And so th that kind of attitude, which is pervasive in government, regardless of party stripe, it, uh, regardless of party stripe, it isn't going to get anywhere. There's, there's two other quick tips that would make a big, uh, ways to make a big difference. The government promised to effectively enforce the Disabilities Act. They aren't. We've revealed that through data's, data that we've gotten from the government. Is it because they don't have the money to effectively enforce the law? 
Answer, no. We got from the government data to show that every single year since the Disabilities Act was enacted, the office responsible for implementing and enforcing it has been under budget to a total tune over, over 10 years of $26.2 million. Now, you could do a lot of enforcement if you spread that out over those years, mm -hmm. and actually we're doing some enforcing. Final point. This summer, Toronto is going to be, the, and Southern Ontario will be hosting the, the Pan and Parapan American Games. This huge event. They're expecting a quarter of a million people to come here. This provides a tremendous impetus if the government would show some leadership for creating more accessible tourism, taxis, transit, mm. and hotels. But we need the government to, they don't have a plan to do this right now. We've been urging them for over a year to do this. So what we're looking at this summer is either of two possibilities. Either Toronto's going to showcase itself to the world as a, a wonderful tourism destination for people with disabilities who number over a billion around the world, or more likely, it's going to be a global embarrassment. Well, let me pick up on that in our last minute here, David Onley. You, you, there's two ways to get things done in life. <laughs> Carrot and stick, right? Honey and vinegar. Yeah. Uh, you're the former Queen's representative. Are you hamstrung by what you can do? Because it might be a very powerful thing if you were to get out there and sort of well, in raise my as, my, as my in my capacity to the as advisor to the minister responsible, Brad Duguid, um, I can just assure you that the in, the advice is going to be no so nonsense and straightforward, uh, oriented towards very practical solutions. Because I think right now it's a series of consecutive practical solutions that don't cost a lot. Uh, that don't require a lot of government intervention, that are beneficial to the economy, that demonstrate that this ultimately is a win-win-win situation. Nobody loses to make the province more accessible. Nobody. And we just haven't sold that argument well enough over the last number of years. We thank the two of you for coming into TVO tonight and making it. David Onley, thank David you. Lepofsky, great to thank see you. both of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.